This is IAT 806, Lecture 5, Methods and Classes. So today what we're going to talk about is, uh, first, a few good programming classes um, in which we remind you of advice I've given before about uh, the kinds of things you should do when writing programs in order to maintain your sanity when you want to look at programs later on. Next, we'll talk again about methods, just as a reminder. And then we're going to d delve a little bit more deeply into classes. Uh, we're going to use as our il illustrative thing, uh, rockets and asteroids again. And then we'll talk about subclasses, what that means and how they make sense. And we'll also talk briefly about methods that return values. So first about the good practices. First, comments, once again, are your friend. Put a block of comments at the top of each program that explains what it does. And the reason why you want to do this is because comments explain to yourself later what's going on. They also explain to us as TAs and profs, you know, what your program is doing and uh, equally important who you are. Um, because if uh, we don't know who that is, it's going to be a problem. So um, always put comments at the top of each program, no matter how small the program or indeed how small the comment. Another thing that can be valuable is putting a comment for each of the major sections of the code. Um, some of the time, the purpose of the comment is for you to explain to us what's going on. But another part of the time, it's also for you to explain to yourself what you're planning to do. And that can be really valuable. Writing that explanation helps make the plan. So um, that's very important. Third on this list, comment when you appropriate code. And what I mean by that is, let's say you've grabbed some code somewhere else that you found on the internet somewhere on, say, Processing's website or something. It's a good idea to tell us that, that you've done that. Um, that can be very valuable to evaluate the stuff that you've contributed and to evaluate the work um, that you know others have helped you with. Don't be afraid to appropriate code, but you've got to tell us that you've done it. And the reason why it's valuable is that it's a great way to uh, increase your productivity, as it were, and increase the ability for you to create interesting and exciting programs. The second major piece of programming advice or good, pro, uh, good practices is auto format. So there's this feature in, um, uh, sorry, in um, uh, processing, which allows you to reformat code. So I'm just going to show a little example here for a second. Um, so here, uh, uh, what I'm doing is I'm showing uh, a chunk of uh, processing code. And what I can do is I can uh, use the tools. Sorry, where is it? And auto format the code. There it is. Now, because my code is formatted reasonably well, it didn't really do much. But if I start messing things around, such as with here, And uh, once again, go here, control T, I get neat code again. So um, auto format, what it does is it parses the code and follows a bunch of rules as to where to br put brace, braces, parentheses, and so on and so forth. And it can be really valuable if you've done a bunch of, uh, written a bunch of code and kind of uh, not really paid attention to spacing, hitting auto format helps put the spacing in the canonical spots and that makes it easier to read the code later. Okay, finally, one of the things with respect to maintaining readability is to put stuff in the same place all the time. I'd mentioned this live earlier uh, in the course, but uh, one of the things that you should try to always to do is put your variables up top, either at the start of the entire program or at the start of uh, you know a method that you uh, that you've uh, created. Um, so at the start start of setup, at the start of draw, uh, or at the top of the program overall. Um, we also, when we're defining classes, we tend to put the fields, the data, um, put the variables there. All right, so that's it for that kind of programming advice. Now let's move on to um, methods. So once again, methods are also known as functions. That is to say, those are methods that return something, so like sine and cosine re return something, or procedures, methods that do things but don't return a value to the piece of code that called it. And here is a classic method definition. And this is, you know, some method I'm just 
making up out of thin air. Void vending machine, int coin sense, it takes the, uh, a single parameter. And all it does is uh, what can be no called a side effect. It uh, print do uh, does print line, you inserted coin sense, sense, something very simple. And the method call is equally simple here. So we uh, create an integer variable named quarter, assign its value 25, we uh, call vending machine quarter. And what that does, it will print you inserted coin sense sense um, uh, on the on the debug in the black debug area. So once again, the way in which uh, the declarations work is uh, the return type of the method is goes first. If you are not returning anything or not planning to have the method return any, anything, you need to say void there. Then the name of the method uh, with an open parenthesis and any parameters that you wish to declare. The purpose of these parameters is values you pl you, that you are passing from the caller into the method. And the, presumably the method is going to use the, that parameter or those parameters to do something. Um, you close uh, the parenthesis to um, end the list of parameters. If you have more than one, you separate, you know, int coin sense, int something else with commas. And then open and close brace that um, tells you the beginning and the end of the method. And between that, you put the chunks of code that you need the method to do. In this case, once again, it's just this single line of, uh, of code, which does, does print line. This method declaration is like a blueprint. It doesn't matter if the declaration is before or after the call. I mentioned this earlier uh, in uh, earlier on in the course. But you know, if, if you define the method in one spot, you can call it from anywhere within your program, um, and uh, as long as the method itself is in some sense visible. Um, para the parameter name coin sense is just the name given to the data passed to the method. Where that name com comes from is up to you. You need to call, you know, the parameter by a name that means something to this, you know, the semantics of the method. This thing is a trivial little method, so you know, uh, the thing coin sense is a verbose name. I'm giving it just to make uh, clear what it is that I'm doing with this method. Um, the more um, there's a limit to verbosity, but you know, uh, single variable names tend to be a little bit hard to unpack once you've, you know, stepped away from the code for a few weeks. You don't understand what you know Q and R are anymore, and uh, so it's best to use names that are memorable and clearly tell you what the purpose of the parameter is. Okay, so the method call, um, the call uh, must match the parameters. If you don't have the right type of parameter, or if you don't have the right number of parameters, you'll get an error. Uh, at compile time, the program won't even run. And so here's an example of just calling vending machine with the value, with the, this integer uh, variable named quarter. And so int vending machine quarter is equivalent to saying vending machine 25 in this case, because right above we assign quarter the value 25. The method call in processing must occur in either setup or draw or some other method that eventually somehow or other it, within the processing system has been called by setup or called by draw or called by the chain of things that setup and draw triggers. Um, in r Java programs, you know, a method needs to be called by something that somehow or other is uh, ultimately triggered by what's called public static void main, main being the name of the, the, the starting place for Java programs. You can call this method as many times as you like, you know, uh, and, you know, there's no limit um, other than, you know, your patience at seeing, you know, coin sense coming up all the time. So the next major chunk that we talked about and introduced in the previous lecture is classes. So recall, let's uh, just spend a little t a bit of time talking about types before we moved on to uh, classes in, in particular. So recall that we uh, mentioned a number of primitive types, int, float, char, or for characters, uh, boolean, and a few others. We also have mentioned objects. We talked about array. There's an object, another object string, so all those things in double quotes are, in, in fact, objects of the type string, but we haven't really dealt with that much so far in the course. And any number of classes. The reason for having classes become types is so that you can 
declare that there is a variable that holds information that embodies an instance of a class, that inside that variable, there's all the fields and all the methods that operate on those fields. That's what the class is for. And it, the type system is the means by which you communicate the creation of this package of information called a, uh, an object that is defined by a class. That stuff lives in a single variable um, of the type that is the class name. So we've worked with some objects before, like arrays. And of course, we can make our own objects, and we've shown how already. And the purpose of creating objects is to keep all related data together. And part of the challenge of writing, or, you know, uh, writing programs is, you know, uh, first off, breaking down the problem of build of the 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 problem you want to solve into sub problems that you can solve by writing smaller bits of code. And the other thing that eventually comes along is once you've written a lot of code, you might find yourself doing various things repeatedly, or you might say, you know, I'm kind of have the variables that I'm playing with kind of scattered all over the program or things like that. And that is the purpose of a class or a number of classes, perhaps, um, to hold um, subparts of the program's logic together and for you to keep that all in one spot. The reason why you want to have all that stuff in one spot is to essentially for the purposes of one-stop shopping for all the knowledge that you need about, say, a rocket in our rockets and asteroids case, or all the knowledge you need about a vending machine uh, in this not filled out example I've kind of um, suggested, or all the information you might need about an asteroid in the rocket and asteroids thing once again. Keep all that related data with methods to control that data. The advantage of doing so is if there's only one place to go to look for that information, that means uh, that you can enforce that nobody, no other piece of code somewhere can reach inside that suite of classes and mess things up. And it's usually the case that messing things up isn't a matter of maliciousness. It's just people don't know what you're trying to do with your class and they, you know, they're well-meaning and they mess, you know, folks would in particular in procedural programming languages, they just forget that there was some kind of rule uh, about how this, these variables are to be treated. They wrote, wrote some code to play with the data. It messed things up. What's worse is that sometimes it messed things up and nobody detected that it messed things up. Object-oriented programming is uh, built with the idea of taking steps towards preventing accidental screw-ups. It's not an absolute prevention, but it gets, gets closer than the procedural programming style. So, once again, classes are blueprints for objects. That is to say, they set out the structure, and the actual objects themselves are instances of this class that you store in variables of the type that, uh, that is named uh, after the, the class name. So, to declare a new class, a new type of object, we do something like this. Here we're just showing the declaration without any details at all. Class my toy, so that's a name I've created just to be something, and there's some fields in it, and there's some methods in it. There ought to be some constructors in it too, but I haven't, you know, this is just a, a trivial example just for the purposes of reminding you of the structure. So um, now we'll uh, create a different class, this time called MySquare, and once again I'm going to do some computer graphics as the standing example. So class MySquare, I've shown it to you briefly already, uh, has two fields namely xpos and ypos, and has a single constructor. Uh, this constructor is not yet complete because I haven't said the types here of x and y, but just for brevity to um, you know, have the slide layout uh, be friendly, uh, I've just uh, suppressed those. I'll show uh, in processing uh, the real declaration in a sec. Um, so, uh, in essence, what uh, the constructor does is just takes these incoming variables and assigns them to xpos and ypos. So every time you create a mysquare, there's only one way to do it, and that is to assign its position. And there's one method. It's called drawme, um, and it just simply does, you know, a rect call uh, at xpos, ypos, and sets the size to be the standing uh, fixed size, 50-50. Let's now go to um, the chunk of processing, and we can see that uh, has happened here. Here's class mysquare, once again, right? Uh, into xpos, ypos. 
and there's the constructor where I've said uh, what the constructor parameter types are instead of just x and y as in the slides. Same assignment of uh, the fields to the initial uh, from the initial values given by the constructor, and this thing single draw me. So um, going back to the slides for a second, um, what we can do with uh, this class is now construct instances. So we have two just code sort of out in the middle of nowhere. Square of my square uh, my square square one. Uh, equals new my square 1010 and my square square 2 equals new my square 2090. So there's a couple of my squares that we've constructed. Let me show you the code. Where the code ends up in this case is um, is in uh, is in uh, uh, setup. So let me scroll up there. So there's the two constructions that we showed just a second ago in the slides. Um, so my square square one equals new my square 1010 and my square square two equals new my square 2090. I'm saying square a billion times here, but you'll just have to bear with it. Uh, and then we're, we draw it, uh, draw each one once. So going back to the slides for a sec, what that does before the draw is create these two squares and I've just kind of indicated that there is the class the blueprint, and down below there's these two squares in which the memory for x and x pause and y pause are stored separately for each of the uh, squ uh, my squares. And there's a 1010 for square one, and sorry, and uh, 2090 for square two. On the next slide, we show actual calls to draw them, and here in the draw window, which I've sketched up, that's where they would appear. Let's just now see that in processing and uh, press play there and uh, boom after a sec there it is and you can see those are the two squares that ended up in the spot roughly that i depicted in uh in the slides so this is square one here at 1010 and this is square square two here at 2090. and this the the size the only thing that i didn't show in the slides is that um i've set the uh, size to be 200 uh, by 200. So the, you know, the uh, processing drawing area is in a slightly different location this time, that's all. Okay, so um, that's, a, you know, just a straightforward little example of, um, you know, uh, creating methods. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an array of these things. The place I'm going to create that array is in setup. So let me get back to that and we'll just go ahead and do that. So... Instead, we're going to get rid of that stuff and say, um, I'm going to create my square, uh, open close square bracket, saying here comes an array, and call it squares, and equals new my square square bracket 10. Now, there's a special little wrinkle going on here, and that is what we've done when we create this squares thing is we've created storage for references to squares. We haven't actually created this uh, 10 my squares yet. What we've done is created only the array to store my squares. This will become clear in a sec. Let me move this up above just so it's, uh, sorry. I'm uh, doing some silly things here. Talking and programming at the same time is difficult. Just one second. There, there we go. Stick the size back in there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to do the second part that you have to do when you're constructing, say, arrays of objects. First you construct the array, and then you construct the, each of the individual objects. So let's do that right now. Put the comment in, and then... Uh, our usual integer variable i and I'm saying 10 I'm use I know the value is 10 so I'm not using a constant anywhere you know I didn't say final size equals 10 anywhere so I'm just putting open and close bra uh, braces around the for loop and what I'm going to do is gen then initialize each one mm -hmm. 
So each square equals new Oh, sorry. I've actually screwed this up. It should be i times 10. And one more. There we go. So that's the code from, uh, from the slide. And now what I'm going to do is Now, the reason why this works is press play. Let's see if I'm right about it working. La 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 la. Can't, uh, I spelled my square wrong. Yes, completely wrong. It was nice square. You don't get any points for spotting that because he didn't tell me while I was recording it. Uh, just sorry, kidding. All right, one more time. There we go. So there's square number four, uh, the square index four. It's actually the fifth square because the array starts at zero, if you recall. Um, what we could do is put another uh, loop in and draw all of them. I'm going to do that uh, here. Get rid of that. So I'm going to do some redundant drawing here. Uh, I uh, let me let's press play. And we see a bunch of squares with uh, square number four, you know, the square index number four. So there's square zero, square one, square two, square three, square four. Let's go back to square one, sorry. Uh, and there's square number four. It's been drawn again, so it's on top of all the other ones. And that, But in any case, here's square zero through nine that have been drawn. Okay, so um, what I have to do when constructing um, uh, constructing an array that is an array of references to classes is I have to first construct the array and that's what happens up here and then I have to construct each of the individual elements of the the array um, Java requires you to actually be explicit about that construction let's uh, just uh, go to uh, edit and auto format that make the code look a little bit neater and you see auto format makes it look nice now um, and so as I was kind of typing fast and talking at the same time you saw uh, that uh, you know we ended up with you know not great format and now uh, that's gotten fixed up and the code's a bit easier to read it enforces the spacing around parentheses and so on uh, I happen to like it and uh, it makes things easier to read okay so that's the end of part one of um, uh, lecture 5 methods and classes. We'll pick up with a new suite of examples in part 2 after this.